Paris, 1933. Perhaps the most eventful year in the history of British tennis. The scene is the Stade Roland Garros on the occasion when Great Britain won the challenge round of the Davis Cup after an interval of 26 years, beating France by three matches to two. The British team consisted of Fred Perry, Lonnie Austin, and Harold Lee and Pat Hughes, whom you see here on the right of the picture, coming out to oppose Borotra and Brigno. Pat Hughes has played 22 Davis Cup matches for Great Britain and also won the doubles championship at Wimbledon in 1936. And now here's something very different. Club tennis, played by thousands, even millions, as a recreation. By millions who can never hope to reach international standard, but who are always anxious to improve their game. Compared with international tennis, well, it's hardly the same game. The novice, as a rule, is awkward in style, always in a hurry, and generally late on the ball, so that there's little rhythm in the play. The game, to him or to her, is largely one of hit and hope. Now let's go back to the Stade Roland Garros and take another look at Davis Cup play with its lightning drives, volleys, knobs and smashes, first-class tennis by those who really made a study of the game. And here is the British team carrying off the fruits of victory. The Davis Cup first competed for in 1900. On the extreme left of the screen is Pat Hughes. And here he is stepping over the years to provide you with some useful hints on how to improve your play. The two most popular grips used today are known as the Continental and the Eastern. With the Continental grip, the top face piece of the handle fits plumb in the fork of the hand. Here is a diagram showing the top face piece, the cross section of the racket handle, and here it's adapted to the Continental grip. With this grip, there's no change of hold for the backhand stroke. In the eastern grip, probably the most popular amongst leading players, it's the right-hand edge of the top face piece which fits into the fork of the hand. In the eastern grip, a slight turn of the racket to the right is necessary for the backhand stroke. Either of these grips may suit you, so it's worth giving a trial to both. Let's start by observing the way in which a first-class player receives the service and returns it. Here you see in slow motion how the stroke should be played. Pat Hughes is crouched down in an easy position with his racket held well up and his knees bent. The weight of his body is forward on his toes, and he's watching his opponent keenly in a position that gives him steady balance and readiness to move in any direction. As he makes his stroke, the weight of his body is transferred from the rear to the front foot, thus giving the ball speed and force. Here he's preparing for a backhand return. Notice particularly how he moves into position, getting the feet parallel to the baseline with the toes pointing towards the tram lines. No ugly or sudden movements. The good player gets into position in ample time and makes a rhythmic swing, transferring the weight from the rear to the front foot and producing a smooth stroke with a minimum of effort. There's no standing about or waiting for it. He's on the move the whole time, eyes on his opponent, and always ready to get into the best position as early as he can. And that means good footwork. The importance of good footwork in all sports and games is well known. The principle of good footwork in tennis is the same for all strengths, and consists of getting into position 
sideways to the net before the stroke is made, with your toes pointing towards the tram lines and your shoulder pointing towards the net. This is something that you can practice away from the tennis court, at home in the garden, or even indoors. Go on placing yourself in this position until it becomes a habit, and move sideways instinctively each time you approach the ball. In contrast now, watch an ordinary young club player awaiting service. His position isn't bad in some respects, but his weight is back in his heels and he merely gives the ball the best crack he can. And what's more, he remains nailed to the ground after his stroke and so is ill-prepared for the next one, if any. Hmm. Pat ball again. He just stands stiffly and waits for the ball to come to him before making a half-hearted scoop at it. Yes, there's a big difference between Pat Ball and Pat Hughes. You must make your stroke standing sideways to the net, not facing it, whether you are playing forehand or backhand. That's better. Let's try it again. No, he's forgotten already. Don't point your toes at the net. Have your feet parallel with the baseline. And get right down for the low ball with your shoulder towards the net and the weight of the body behind your stroke. This is the first and all-important rule of tennis. And although it looks simple enough, and is simple enough in practice, uh, without the ball, it's quite a different problem in actual play. Now bend those knees and keep your body weight forward. That's better. You can see the difference, can't you? Now we'll just ask Pat Hughes to take us through the drill once more. It's the same as you've seen before, but you can't watch a demonstration of the fundamentals too often if you really want to improve your game. It looks delightfully easy when it's well done, but it takes many months of hard practice to achieve the coordination of eye, hand and foot together with the timing that makes up the perfect stroke. This is a low backhand return held for inspection. As you see, Pat Hughes has his weight on the front foot and his shoulder points to the net. The racket is firmly grasped and held parallel to the ground. Here's the start of the stroke. Weight on the rear foot, shoulder towards the net, and eyes on the ball. The racket was held well up, and arm and racket have swung smoothly through all in one piece, the ball being taken just in front of the forward leg. But don't forget, you've got to keep on your toes the whole time if you're going to do any good. And you must be in the correct position to make your stroke before the ball comes up to you if you're going to strike it at the correct point. You just can't play a good stroke from a bad position. Notice how the full weight of the body is put into the drive and how the racket head is always kept well up and never allowed to droop. Here's our club player again, now showing a marked improvement. He looks much more business-like now, though he's still a bit stiff in his play and hasn't yet quite got the smooth, easy action of the good player. But constant practice, if it doesn't make perfect, will at least work wonders. A few minutes ago, Pat Hughes showed the necessity for getting right down to a low ball. Just to remind you, here's a still picture of the stroke. Weight on the front foot, shoulder towards the net, wrist firmly locked, and the racket head held parallel to the ground. Notice again, the good player is always in position for the stroke and hardly has to move his feet to make it. 
racket head is here pointing up. And the broken line shows the course of the swing around and down. The ball is taken just in front of the forward leg with a smooth follow through. The low backhand return follows the same pattern. Points to notice once more are the shoulder pointing towards the net, eyes on the ball, and the racket sweeping through parallel to the ground. As you can see, the whole body turns and swings into the ball, not just the arm and racket. In this way, the full weight of the body goes into the stroke. You can see that the player is perfectly balanced, even with his legs crossed and has no difficulty in recovering his position. Now here's another young club player dealing with a low ball. Easy to see that there's everything wrong with his stroke. His weight is bearing equally on his two flat feet as he stands facing the net, shoulder pointing to the sky and toes turned out. He's hitting the ball with his arm only and his swing has been vertical not horizontal. So he's dropped the head of his racket and is practically certain to loft the ball. Compare it for a moment with the correct position. There really isn't any comparison, is there? No, that won't do, will it? It's no use standing up straight in a stiff position and lofting the ball. Get right down to it and crack the ball with a horizontal swing. Like this. Matching the back swing with the height of the ball. And so, into the volley. Notice that there's practically no back swing in the volley and that the force of the stroke is derived from meeting the ball with a locked and absolutely stiff wrist. The racket head must never be dropped. At whatever height the ball is volleyed, the racket head must be kept at or above wrist level. It's a kind of blocking stroke, requiring a firm grip and good footwork. There are, of course, occasions during play close to the net uh, when there's no time for the player to get sideways. He then has no alternative but to make his stroke from a frontal position. The rule here is to throw the weight of the body forward onto the foot which is nearer the ball. This gives added impetus to what would otherwise be a very feeble shot. Here you see in slow motion how a forehand volley should be taken. Notice once more the shoulder pointed at the net and the toes pointing towards the tram line. And since there's very little swing in the volley, the position of the feet and body is more important than ever. Now a high forehand volley. The racket is held firmly with an absolutely locked wrist. This stroke is in the nature of a punch or jab, and unlike the drive, there's practically no follow through. This time, a backhand volley. Shoulder again towards the net, and a forward punch at the ball with a locked wrist and with the face of the racket slightly opened. This is a definite stroke, not a mere collision of the ball and racket. Here's the youngster on the job, making an extremely poor and optimistic stroke. As you can see, he merely steers his racket into the path of the ball. His wrist is wobbling and his body weight is on his heel. Here he comes again. Look at him facing the net and dropping the head of his racket. No wonder his stroke is feeble and that he's got no idea where the ball is going. No, that just won't do. Get your shoulder pointing to the net, grip your racket firmly with a locked wrist and keep the racket head above wrist level. And now for the service. The points to note here are the height at which the ball is struck, the swing of the racket, the angle at which the racket meets the ball, the position of the feet, the bending of the knees, and the shift of the weight 
from the rear to the front foot. Here's a slow motion analysis. Watch the weight of the body shifting to the front foot and the follow through of arm and leg. Notice that the service, like all the other strokes we've seen, is made with the shoulder pointing to the net. The knees are flexed, the ball is thrown straight up, the racket swung like an Indian club, and the ball struck at the highest point that the racket can conveniently reach. Here's the learner doing the same stroke, believe it or not. He stands solidly facing the net, throws the ball aloft to any old height, and slaps at it optimistically. He has no backswing, his legs are stiff, and his weight is on his heels. In fact, he's serving with his arm only. No wonder he achieves such miserable results. Hold it. Let's have a look at this one. The same old faults. A bad position facing the net with the weight on both feet. And as for his swing, well, you can't really call it a swing. Let's flash back and see how he should be standing at this moment. And the course that his racket should follow. You can see from Pat Hughes's attitude that the learner has no idea of the correct stroke. This is how he look when he's hitting the ball using only his forearm and wrist. And here's Pat Hughes at the same moment, hitting the ball at arm's length with his full weight as he pivots forward on his left foot. We'll skip back and let the learner complete his stroke. You can see what a feeble effort it is, can't you? But you'll never do any better if you just stand squarely facing the net and swing your racket only from the shoulder. This again is all too usual in club play. Get your shoulder pointing towards the net. Gather yourself together. Bend your knees. Throw the ball straight up. And hit it with the full weight of your body at the top of your swing as you bring your weight forward. That looks more like it even though now he's dipping his head at the end of the stroke instead of keeping his eyes on the ball. Now, the upward throw of the ball is an important part of a good service. You want to learn to throw it straight up to the same point every time, this being just the height at which you can get at it with your arm and racket fully extended. So, practice throwing up the ball until you can make it drop on the same spot every time. It's not easy to do, but it's well worth practicing. Finally, notice that the throw-up for the service should be made so that the ball falls slightly away from you and not towards you. Practice the throw-up and your service all you can, even though there may be no one at the other side of the net. A good attacking service is something you don't see very often and you can't pick it up merely in the ordinary course of play. See the weight coming onto the front foot and the ball hit at arm's length with the full weight of the body behind it. Take out as many balls as you can lay hands on and carry on by yourself. Don't be self-conscious about it. The best of players do this regularly. It's a good plan to put targets down, one near the center line and one near the opposite corner, and see how close you can get to them. And don't forget, speed is by no means everything. A good service must be an accurate. If you can get someone to practice with you, so much the better. Take it in turns to send the balls to each other so that a stroke can be repeated until you get the grip of it. Don't bother about winning points. Just concentrate on improving your game by repetition of individual strokes. Then ask your friend to send over lobs so that you can practice your smash. And keep on at this for five minutes or so. Then move up to the net and practice your volley, sticking at it forehand and backhand again and again. Above all, never lose an opportunity of studying better players than yourself in action. Concentrate on the player you're most interested in, study his footwork, and see how he prepares for the stroke before he makes it. And you'll learn much 
to help you towards